Okay, well, uh, it's good to see all of you. I'm Howard Snyder. I'm representing the Man the, the uh, Heather Manchester was the Research Center. Sorry, wrong event. <laughs> uh, the Committee on Free Methodist History and Archives and uh, the Marston Memorial Historical Center. And more uh, than that, for this event today, the, uh, the Zahnheiser family and the dedication of uh, the Zahnheiser Chapel, which we've been working at uh, for some time. Uh, Mindy, the Professor Cromwell, who is the chair of the uh, Committee on Free Methodist History and Archives, has some scriptures that she's going to read at this time. All right, our first reading is our first reading is Jeremiah chapter seven, verses one through seven. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions, and deal with each other justly. If you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 17. beginning in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is, in, is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offering, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When we open the um, chapel here in a little bit, you will find inside uh, a brochure uh, that describes a little bit more about the uh, Zahnheiser family and legacy and the why of it, and also an essay by Marvin Zahnheiser on uh, the history of the five Zahnheiser brothers whom uh, we are commemorating and that whole family and their descendants. We have pictures uh, here. I was trying to think how can we, uh, how, how might I encapsulate um, a little bit of the Zahnheiser legacy, and I thought, well, in terms of our history today and so on, uh, we there are four grandsons of the five Zahnheiser brothers who have been involved uh, in this project. One is Marvin Zahnheiser. Uh, Marvin is the son of Ralph Zahnheiser, Ralph Allison Zahnheiser, um, a grandson, I should say. Uh, his father was uh, Clarence Howard Zahnheiser, who got very interested in B.T. Roberts and wrote his doctoral dissertation on it, which was published as Ernest Christian. Of course, it was a, was a major uh, resource for me when I was doing Pop of the Saints. So Marvin Sonizer, who is not able to be with us today, uh, more than any other one person, is responsible for us being able to come to this time uh, through personal gifts, through helping to network among the Sonizer family in terms of fundraising. It was also Marvin Zahnheiser, who uh, uh, took the boxes of the B.T. Roberts paper, that is, papers that his father had been able to pull together out, out at Roberts Wesleyan College, personally contacted 
the Library of Congress and transported those boxes down to uh, Washington, D.C., which is where they are today. Because we have uh, microfilm of those, uh, re those boxes of papers here at the Marston Historical Center. They also, uh, there's also a copy of them at, uh, at Roberts Wesleyan College. So Marvin Sennheiser would be one. Uh, another descendant, grandson of uh, Ralph Allison Sennheiser uh, is uh, Wayne Lawton, some of you know, whom we regard as, as kind of the Sennheiser family genealogist because he's pulled together a lot of the information. And if I want to know who was married to who and who was descended of whom, he's the one I go to uh, for that. Um, and then uh, Matt Sennheiser is here. And uh, he has the same initials as his grandson, Archibald Howard McElrath Zonizer, except that his name is Allison Howard Matthias Zonizer, and uh, so he get, you know, gets called Matt. Uh, I am the grandson of Jacob J. Snyder, whom these pictures appears to be the tallest and the baldest uh, of, the, uh, of the five uh, Zonizer brothers. After the revival in Pennsylvania uh, and the conversion uh, of, from very nominal uh, Christianity uh, to uh, vital faith in Jesus Christ by their mother. Uh, all five of the brothers and other siblings became Free Methodists, and these five brothers became uh, pastors in the Free Methodist Church and served in various uh, other ways as well. So we are thankful for the Zonizer family, but also very much aware that uh, this is only one of, of many families, uh, many of whom, by the way, now because, largely because of free Methodist uh, educational institutions, have become interrelated in, uh, in, in various ways in uh, the uh, free Methodist uh, uh, intermingling of DNA uh, across <laughs> the generations. Um, but I wanted you to get some sense of how this Zonizer chapel and project fits into the larger project of the Marston Historical Center. And so I've asked uh, uh, Kathy Robling, who uh, in January will have completed 20 years as director of the uh, Marston Historical Center, completed but not ending, you know, <laughs> continuing on. Uh, but I've invited her to come and speak a little bit from that standpoint. Kathy. Thank you, Howard. I did want to um, just share that the World Ministry Center staff, um, we have been eagerly awaiting this day. We have been watching construction taking place and um, just very thankful uh, to the donors who have um, had this vision along with us. We want to express our appreciation to them. Phase one of our project was completed in 2013, and that was the new climate-controlled Free Methodist Archive, um, named in honor of Evelyn Marston Mottweiler. It houses the church's 157-year history, and we have um, preserved journals and ledgers and documents and letters and photographs, and they're all being cared for in um, made accessible to researchers. So that was the first section of what we were wanting to accomplish here. Um, as the ministry is expanding globally, the historical center is increasing access to material that is housed here. So all of this that you see here now is phase two of our projects that we've been working on. And as the new expanded library takes shape, you can see that we've been meeting in it, so it's full of tables, but we hope to have bookshelves and the books replaced there. Um, in the expanded space, so we will be adding um, many books that have been collected in the last several years that have been written by Free Methodists that have been donated here to be added to the library. So this all aids in resourcing the global church. Historical books are being digitized and made available online. Um, our car catalog soon will be completed um, in the digitization process of that and be placed on what be placed online as well. And interested persons will be able to review um, the library holdings from near and far. And we've already um, had proof of how um, our uh, library and resources here are being used uh, globally, and so we just hope that that will increase. By popular demand, the Light and Life Hour display will now be housed in a new studio right here. And Light and Life Communications can use this space for recordings 
as well as visitors sharing stories of experiences in the Free Methodist Church. So um, as I'm looking at your faces and you're here at another time when we've got that up and running, we would love for you to stop by and add to our oral history project by sharing your story. More plans are coming together for our display area that we're kind of standing in right here. You may be able to use an iPad to view photos or read a sermon while you're standing at B.T. Roberts' pulpit desk or listen to a sermon while you're sitting at Bishop Marston's desk or standing at the pulpit where Bishop Ellis preached. So those are all some vision um, casting ideas that we have. Our goal is to create a more interactive display and museum place. Thank you for continuing to support the ministry um, that uh, is taking place at the Marston Historical Center on behalf of the Free Methodist Church. So this is mostly, as you can see, open space here now, but it will be filled over a period of time with various kinds of displays, historical artifacts, and as uh, Kathy mentioned there, uh, the library, uh, resources by uh, many authors, including free Methodist authors. Now, uh, uh, authors. now uh, we have each book with a barcode uh, and interconnected uh, with uh, with other libraries. So we're, we are thankful for that. I've asked Bishop David Kendall to uh, say a few words about how this fits into the larger mission of the Free Methodist Church. Thank you, Howard, and uh, good afternoon. What a wonderful opportunity and uh, joy it is to uh, participate in the dedication of the new chapel at the heart of the uh, Marston Memorial um, Historical Center. I was uh, invited to share a few words about uh, uh, history for today, and so I have this 45-minute lecture. <laughs> Not really, but I did, uh, I did make a few notes here, uh, a few observations. Um, our history, when it properly orients us, um, is one of the most, uh, if not the most, valuable resources we have for identifying the pitfalls and the pathways uh, along the way that we've come to the present time. Uh, pitfalls to be avoided and pathways uh, to take. Um, in the 21st century, when everything is changing uh, faster than we can uh, really observe, I mean, we almost have to read about the changes that we've been through but didn't know we've been through them. Uh, that's the, the, the speed of change around us. In that kind of a world, a lot of uh, folk worry, I think, that if we pay very much attention to history, we might just get stuck in some way. But I believe that that's really a needless worry. Mm -hmm. Because to take our history seriously, to know where we came from and then how it is we got to the present hour, does not necessarily lead us to be stuck or to be preoccupied with things that don't matter. In fact, I think, you could, I think you could make a good argument that the dangers are really in the opposite direction. That a people who forget where they truly came from and how it is they got to the present moment, uh, in their amnesia are likely to substitute their memory, their personal memory, or maybe their family memory for the history and confuse the two and you know when you do that you find yourself um, on a rut and stuck indeed and so I think this is a needless worry um, and especially if uh, we're determined as uh, I know we are to keep in mind the triune God who self discloses in the person of Jesus at the center of who we are. When Israel gets into trouble, it's because the nation forgot God and all that God did for her. And one of the ways the world, uh, the church gets in trouble is by forgetting or neglecting its originating commitments and passions. 
uh, those dynamic spiritual um, empowerings and callings that launched the church in the first place uh, as the church sought to be faithful to Jesus and continue his witness to Jesus. And so it just seems to me how fitting it is that at the near the center of uh, our historical center, there should be a chapel. Um, not as a museum. And uh, I think we've already heard that the plans uh, will guard against that. Not as a museum, but as, um, but as a, a sacred space into which uh, people who are at home here, more or less, and occasional visitors are invited in to remember and learn and encounter the one who remains the same, Lord Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever. God's people lose their way and jeopardize their future, not because they forget historical data, not because they, for, they forget the specifics of this event or that, or maybe get confused about a date occasionally. No, we get into trouble and we place in jeopardy our future when we forget the God whose larger salvation story explains and empowers our past. The danger is not forgetting data. The danger is forsaking the God who assigns us our portion of his global mission to love and call all the world's people to their true home. So a chapel makes sense. Uh, and the invitation to come and pause and remember, to listen and learn, uh, to reconnect, to reflect, to imagine again how we might connect with something that, after all, remains still living and thriving. That's a wonderful invitation to have. And we would always be the poorer not to accept it. I hope that the people called Free Methodists, and I, I mean, I, so we're together as the BOA, we're having our meeting, we're talking about the future. Uh, I mean, we're all, we're all in for the best future we believe that God has for us. But I know we're likewise united um, around a number of things, among which would be um, we would never want to be at a place where we stop asking, what does it mean to be alive with God by the power of the Holy Spirit? on a missional adventure with Jesus. What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be loving? What does it mean to be agents of holiness and love in a world that is broken and it doesn't know it, but is longing for what only its God can provide and in fact has already provided? Uh, we don't ever want to be in a place where those are not central burning questions that just draw us in and require us to answer for the sake of our world, uh, for the love of our God, and for the well-being of all of creation. So how uh, fitting it is that uh, sort of in concentric circles, somewhere near the center is a chapel for a historical center for a world ministry center, as, as we're calling it these days, out of which flows all sorts of ministries that literally reach around the entire world and bless many, many people. At the heart is sacred space where we encounter and experience and renew our covenants with the Holy God to be a holy and loving people on mission with Him. Uh, I think our hearts are such we would never want it to be any different than that. So, amen. I think uh, Dr. Axel and I are just going to lead us in prayer, or say a few words in prayer.
I didn't plan a few words, but let me say, God bless you all. Let us pray. O oh, eternal God, mighty in power and of incomprehensible majesty, whom the heavens cannot contain, much less the walls of temples made with hands, you have promised your special presence whenever two or three are assembled in your name to offer praise and prayer. By the power of your Holy Spirit, consecrate this chapel, bless us and sanctify what we do here, that this place may be holy for us and a house of prayer for all people. Guide and empower in this place by the same Spirit, the proclamation of your word, the celebration of your sacraments, the miracles of new birth and healing, the pouring out of prayer and the singing of your praise, the professing of faith and the testifying to your grace, the exchanging of vows and the celebration of even death and resurrection. May you, blessed Holy Trinity, who inspired the piety, parenting, and prayers of Henry Martin and Elizabeth Frantz Zahnheiser, who called, upheld, empowered, and guided five of their sons to enter the ministry of your church, followed by a stream of their descendants. May you, gracious Lord, encourage families who worship here May you guide scholars who consecrate their work to your glory here in this chapel. Enlighten seekers of your will who lay their lives open before you here. May disappointment, discouragement, resentment, and fear be dissolved in your love. Jesus. Here, transformed as hope. Save us all from a failure of vision that would confine our worship within even such walls as these. But send those who worship in this chapel out to be your servants in the world, sharing the absolute obedience to you that Jesus our King modeled, even to the point of self-emptying and sacrifice. O oh, Holy Father, may this chapel assist your kingdom coming, your will being done, in its fullness on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 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 The chapel is designed approximately to represent a typical free Methodist chapel or church building of around 1910, which is also the year that a new free Methodist hymnal was published and we will be having some of those on display eventually. There's some things on the inside yet to be taken care of, but we are going to open it this time. I'll ask Director uh, Kathy Fort, Kathy Robling to uh, open, it, open it, and as you are able, we invite everyone to uh, browse and look around and uh, pick up some of the literature. You get a picture, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> 